Reflection, Kindle Edition, The Peace and Hall Press, 2018. Reflections Copyright, Lynette Fromey, 2018. All rights reserved. No part of this book may be reproduced or transmitted in any form or by any means, electronic or mechanical, including photocopying, recording, or by any information storage and retrieval system, except by a reviewer who may quote brief passages in a review to be printed in a newspaper or magazine, without permission in writing from the publisher. For information, contact the Peace and Hall Press at P.O. Box 431, Cobb, California, USA. My edition is the first printing from 2018, Kindle edition 2019. ISBN 978-0-991-3725-2-2. Library of Congress catalog number 201-89-47665. Cover design by Lynette Fromey and Red Wolf. The persons and events described in this book are real and true. In some instances, pseudonyms have been used to protect the privacy of individuals. In such cases, the altered names are indicated by an asterisk the first time they appear. I, Myra Elvira Harding, have been given permission to read this book from the Pisan Hall Press. I will be reading, once again, my Kindle edition, which is a digital download that I got from Amazon. You likely heard of the murders. This book is what happened before and after them along California's beaches and bluffs, San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury, the Redwoods, Topanga Canyon, Beverly Hills, the Santa Susana Mountains, and the Outback of the Mojave Desert. It's about the Charles Manson I perceived, and a gathering of people like me, preparing to survive either a revolution or the static institutions that were systematically trading all of our vital necessities for money. Lynette Fromey, 2018. 1963 to 1967. In 1963, when President Kennedy was murdered, I was in a 10th grade English class waiting for lunch break. A wall speaker delivered the news, and as the class stared dumbly, our mature and stable teacher turned her back to us, sobbing. Now the Russians will come for us. I didn't know which was more shocking the tragedy in Dallas, or our teacher's emotional breakdown. Scanning my mind for anything Russian, I landed upon a vintage foreign film dubbed into English and shown on Saturday afternoon TV. An underage Russian soldier traveling by train on a pass to see a sick mother shares a fleeting romance with a beautiful peasant girl. Such appealing young soldiers on our doorsteps didn't seem like such a bad deal. I felt that our teacher's response was overblown. Anti-Soviet hype aside, wasn't our country stronger than just one man? Outside the classroom, my best friend and I bumped through gloms of other slightly hysterical teens until officials closed the school and sent us home. She probably knew as little as I did about Russians, though her father was on the verge of promotion to Army General and a prestigious post at the San Francisco Presidio. Her house was farther, so we ended up on the piano bench at my house, pounding out anxious duets and excess adrenaline until my father rushed in from the back of the house 
roaring about our lack of respect. I didn't know that he cared about President Kennedy, or that he was even at home. He ordered my friend out of our house and returned to his den. It was a sad and discombobulated time. Charlie, as I knew him, was born out of Terminal Island Federal Prison near the shipyards of San Pedro, California in March of 1967. He was 32. He wore a 1950s era prison issue suit and a Buddy Holly haircut to go with it. I was beginning my first semester of community college 10 miles away in suburban Torrance. I was 18 years old, restless to flippant, in a two-story condo belonging to my parents. I had red hair to my shoulder blades and an old-fashioned skate key on a chain around my neck. I didn't want a diamond ring. Charlie took a bus to San Francisco, where his parole officer was expecting him. Without money, for food or hotel, he tapped the parole officer for ten, and was escorted by a young stranger to the crossroads of Haight and Ashbury Streets, where he was a clean-cut anomaly amid dreams of bearded, long-haired hippies. I didn't know anyone in Torrance, as my family had just moved inland from Redondo Beach, and by May of that year, I was disillusioned. College in Torrance was not the mind-expanding exchange of ideas and information that I had imagined. One night, my father and I clashed over something silly, a word or a definition. Suddenly enraged, he pointed to the door and yelled, You get out of this house and never come back. I cried, stuffing a big purse full of books and makeup and miscellaneous junk. I called my college boyfriend to pick me up, but he said he was too drunk to drive and suggested I hitchhike. It was nearly 9 p.m. when I trudged to the nearest freeway on-ramp and stuck out my thumb, but I wasn't going to see my boyfriend. When we were 16, two friends and I, on weekend explorations, had discovered the boarded-up, apparently deserted town of Venice, one of a handful of L.A. beach towns that periodically boom and bust. We'd wondered what bomb had left this devastation. The cracked cement and shattered glass. An empty theater with a few red plastic pieces still dangling from its marquee. What monster had devoured the population of this bright, stucco suburb to leave it so eerily empty? After kicking around the rubble of a block of vacant shops, we had followed our curiosity through silent neighborhoods where only a curtain moved or a thick-shoed old woman plotted her daily constitutional with a cane. Tidy pre-World War II duplexes were clean, their lawns edged. The few people in evidence were old, and dressed in the style of the Churchills and Roosevelts. And the Second World War that had sloughed off the heels of the first wars and all wars had just moved on, a part of it now in Vietnam. But for us, on street after sunny street, the whole world might have been peacefully snoozing until, on turning a blind corner, we were struck and mugged by the vast Pacific and a beach that was startlingly populated. On the sand, on the strand, and beneath the gazebos, beside a rusty snack wagon and the mute jukebox of an abandoned patio cafe, people ranging spectrums of age, 
race, and culture, leaned and lay dozing, skated and strolled. Women with loose long hair and men with beards. There were painters at sidewalk easels, bookworms stretched out on the sand, bikers, beatniks, odd and end people so cool and comfortable compared to the stiff, cinched in straight people of the early 60s. Rough travelers and homeless squatters in a parallel universe with housewives, bare-limbed preschoolers, and the tanned elderly residents of the low-rent community. We'd read about beatniks, but had never seen one. Passing small groups, we heard conversations and the ideas we had read about. Existentialism, transcendentalism, disestablishmentarianism. There was talk of Alan Watts, Tim Leary, Ken Kesey, discussions about Buddhism, reincarnation, timelessness, and universality. Older black men in berets gathered at a bookstore where the only books on display were by W.E.B. Du Bois. And signs everywhere read, Make love, not war. Some of the beatniks didn't speak, and some spoke in similes. Like this and like that. About New York City and Frisco. Fray trains, saxophone players, rounders, reefer, spare change, and going through changes. To us, they were gems of true character. Unlike the frightened shadows who cheerlessly admitted to being our parents. These were the real people. And if we were respectful and hung around long enough during that year of getaway weekends, they would tell us their stories. They are blended in my memory with the scents of seaweed and yellow mustard and hot grease, with tin-toned transistor radios, distant bongo drums, waves with children's voices in them, and from the toothpick-looking roller coaster tracks high over the Pacific Ocean Park, the rhythmically recurring Coral crescendos. Only two years later, Venice Beach was dark, damp, and utterly deserted. All familiar landmarks gone. A light far down the strand turned out to be from a new bookstore slash gallery whose proprietor and customers seemed too cool to notice me, searching for a face I could trust. The man behind the counter began to close out the cash register, but I could not bring myself to speak. Outside, I moved for cover beneath a gazebo, facing a gloomy sea. The store's light behind me was doused from the sidewalk, its glass doors locked, and as footsteps and car engines faded, I was left in the dark completely alone and at a standstill. My dilemma was broken by a blur. A man in a smuggler's cap, flight jacket, and jeans hopped the half wall in front of me and leaned against it. Animated, smiling, he was old or young. I couldn't tell. He had a two-day beard and reminded me of a fancy bum, elegant, but my fear was up. Name's Charlie, he said, looking directly in my eyes. In San Francisco, they call me the gardener. Sensing my alarm, he said simply, it's all right. And I felt, within the tone of his voice, that he was. He moved 
with smooth confidence. He appeared both big and small. I was enchanted, yet flustered and mentally hiding. And then he wasn't there at all, until I sought him back in earnest, and he was seated on the wall. I gathered in the pieces of my mind. So your father kicked you out, he said with certainty. And once again, my mind went with the wind. But before I could ask how he knew, I began to tell him about a life I imagined living and the so-called reality in which I felt trapped. He said, the way out of that room is not through the door. I puzzled and considered trying windows. Don't want out, he said, and you're free. The want ties you up. Be where you are. You got to start someplace. He had a cleft chin and a southern country accent I would later recognize as typically West Virginian, more a strum than a twang. He said that what I wanted out of thought rather than place Instead of sounding cockeyed, this reminded me of a poem I'd written one sleepless night in a dead-end depression after staring at my gray and red checkered pajamas. Just as children imagine being small enough to walk around the designs and curtains and blankets, I found myself on the gray and red checkerboard, trapped in one gray square. I could not cross its borders. Around and round its edges, I'd paced like a caged animal, collapsing in one corner to gnaw the bare bones of despair. But when I'd looked up, within this fantasy, my square had become a diamond, changing my perspective, it had changed my world. Within Charlie's laugh, I understood. It seemed ironic that it would take a stranger for me to know this comfort. I was most arrested by his eyes. They knew me. He was a present and active intelligence. I didn't understand it. I didn't know what made his face a comfortable place to rest my eyes. He was an older man, I was sure now, with loose brown curls showing beneath his cap, and a jawline that could have been used in shaving commercials. He, in fact, had recently shaved, leaving only the stubble of a full mustache to run down the sides of his mouth and connect with the shadow of a goatee. It was not attractive to me, the sandpapery facial hair. It was too bum-like, too much neglect, but beneath it were decent features. He was neat and appeared clean. He knew something about being trapped, he said, because he'd only recently been released after seven and a half years in prison. Then he revealed to me a glimpse of a life spent in and out of confinement, of the hurt, the anger, and the peace he said finally came with knowing and accepting himself. He was going north to see his mother, he told me, and I could come with him if I wished. I thought about my boyfriend, far from that moment, but this man was a complete stranger. He glanced down the walk. Apparently, someone was waiting for him. I struggled with the decision. 
Finally, he said, I can't make up your mind for you. He smiled sympathetically and was on his way. I watched him go half a block before grabbing my bag of books and running to catch up with him. A bulge of male bodies and one teenage girl were waiting in a beat-up car. Charlie encouraged me to squeeze into the dark between these dim figures, who only grunted acknowledgement. Darlene, a bandanaed brunette, looked hard and didn't even speak when introduced. Half an hour later, when we stopped at a house in the suburbs, I felt relieved. More men were inside, but also Ginger, a stylish, sensible-looking blonde who owned the place. The group in the car had begun to look to me like they might be on an interstate crime spree. Ginger had a square job, and only minor friction with the law. But through some contact of her past, and in common with Charlie, she knew ex-convicts and had a habit of helping them out. That's what she told me while we looked through her closet to find me some clothes. I don't recall what I was wearing. My parents wore gray and beige. During high school, I ditched the blands for paisley dresses and a raw walnut as a pendant. But after graduation, I was back to loafers, slacks, and knit pullovers. Ordinary middle American moderation, skate king aside. Ginger wasn't that different, but at my height, 5'3", she weighed less than 125 pounds. Still, she found me some nice-fitting jeans, cotton blouses, and a lightweight jacket. Then she invited me into the kitchen. The mean Darlene, who was obviously another of Ginger's beneficiaries, was actually pretty in the light. She had claimed a section of the living room where she sat bent over poster paper, drawing. Ginger considered her a true artist. Darlene, it turned out, was a 17-year-old runaway. Arriving in San Francisco two months before, she had been hustled by a street pimp who was handling her luggage when Charlie had recognized and embraced her. Thanking the pimp, he'd taken her bags and headed her in another direction. She had never met Charlie before. The men at the house were cordial with one another, but not friendly. Referring to each other by last names, Charlie was Manson to them. The other names I have since long forgotten, as we could not see Ginger, as we would not see Ginger, nor any but one of the men again. All I knew when four of us got back into the car around midnight was that I would be continuing my travels with several more sets of clothes a stomach full of strawberry shortcake, and three companions that Ginger had known for more than an hour. Darlene fell asleep on the lumpy guy in the back seat while Charlie drove and talked, and I listened. His cap was gone now, revealing well-cut, wavy hair, the leather jacket replaced by a black mac or trench coat. All night long, as geometric shapes of shadow and light flickered across his face, he told me about their travels. He had zest and a knack for storytelling, but how he and Darlene had gone all over the state without being questioned, he being nearly twice her age and an ex-convict, and why, if she was his girlfriend, she was sleeping all over the man in the back seat. I did not know whether in answer to my thoughts or his own, 
He addressed these questions with candor beyond my comfort. He said, Darlene is bright. Darlene is talented. Darlene is a beautiful girl. But Darlene clings to gloom. I can't seem to talk her out of it. I wondered if Darlene was awake. She's had a hard life, he said. Raped when she was 11? Had a baby at 12? I could not imagine. She was self-conscious about her stretch marks when I met her. She wanted to make love in the dark. How gauche. He was telling me the secrets of this girl's anatomy. I told her, those stretch marks are beautiful. Those stretch marks are like a badge. They're part of what you went through to be you. Don't think those marks are ugly. That's somebody else's thinking. I thought to raise another subject. But Darlene is headstrong, he went on. Started running away when she was just a kid. And angry all the time. Fight you in a minute. And I figured that. She's taught me, he counterbalanced. Like most men, I thought I knew what I was doing. I thought I was doing all I needed to make her happy. We had a room in San Francisco, and I was out with some people. This was a few weeks after I met her. She didn't want to go. So I come back to the pad that night, and just as I start to open the door, he acted this out. I hear her in there. As she's going, oh, and ah, and I know what she's doing, but I can't believe it. She's got some guy in there. Not only that, but she's never sounded like that with me. Charlie looked shocked. I laughed, and he smiled. It was an ego death, he said blithely, a comic at the funeral. I mean, I wanted to go in, but I felt like a fool. I couldn't very well. She was obviously enjoying herself. I was so mad, I walked the streets half the night on fire. I realized I wasn't giving her what she wanted. And I didn't know I felt that inadequate to be that jealous. You know, a man wants to think he's all a woman could want or need. He's the man. Little girl comes along and sets him straight. This combination of braggadocio and self-realization sounded true to me, and I felt somehow rewarded by his comeuppance. I was just beginning to gloat when he countered. But then it's her turn. As she don't want to give up her ego, she wants to be on top. But she wants a he-man to look up to. She wants a lord, but she wants to dictate what he thinks. She thinks she wants to be happy, but she's not happy unless she's miserable. He was grinning. I was taken by his honesty and humor, but the subject matter was embarrassingly personal. His language from the streets or below. How could I assent to this? I feel like I was stepping down. As the sun rose, huge and golden, I was weary, and suddenly struck by memories of everyone I was leaving behind. He smiled at my tears and sang, the tenderness in his voice both a catalyst and a comfort to my sadness. When we stopped for gas and to stretch our legs, Darlene and I went into the restroom together. I felt much better. I splashed cold water over my red face and said something simple. But she didn't speak to me. In Berkeley, 
Three of us got out on a street corner, and the big man drove away. Then we walked up a flight of stairs to see Mary in her second floor apartment. Tall and sweet-faced, a natural blonde, Mary had recently quit her job as librarian for the university down the block. She had straight birch blonde hair to her shoulders, round blue eyes, a straight nose, and a well-defined jaw. Poised and articulate, she easily made cornmeal muffins while she and Charlie talked. By the sound of it, we were all going to the woods. I liked the idea, just for a trip. I pulled a pen and tablet from my purse to write a letter to my boyfriend, but it didn't go beyond three lines. I was listening. Darlene was pacing the living room when Charlie finally joined her. Their voices were too low for me to understand, but she was obviously angry. His tone was conciliatory, but she was unreconciled. The talk rose and fell. She was absolutely refusing something. He said something as if giving her permission or telling her he wasn't going to object. Then he walked out of the room. In less than half an hour, Darlene had gathered her belongings and called the big guy to come and take her away. It was so fast and final that I thought I ought to feel something, but I didn't. While Mary took a shower, Charlie spoke highly of her. He and Darlene had been homeless until they'd knocked on Mary's door and she'd taken them in. He told of how funny it was when Mary had discovered him using her toothbrush. I was disgusted. He wouldn't be using my toothbrush either. At the time, I had already imagined him kissing me. The attraction was disconcerting. Something about his moves and casual postures made him interesting to watch. In the evening, after the cornbread and a thick soup that Mary had cooked up, she did the dishes while Charlie sat at the kitchen counter, and I sat in a stuffed chair in the living room. I ceded the chore to her because it was her apartment, her meal, and because... Although she was soft-spoken, everything she did was in a deliberate, almost commanding way. She was four or five years older than me, and possibly as many inches taller. The height emphasized by her thinness and posture. Her clothes were the well-made, expensive college edition Bass, Bower, and Bean, but they were not new and she appeared to dress practically rather than to affect an image. After drying and putting the dishes back into the cupboards, she told us that her taffy-colored dog, a retriever mix, needed to take a walk. She can't wait to get out of the city, Mary sang as they went out the door. Mary and Charlie's relationship seemed both nonchalant and formal. I couldn't tell if it was more than a friendship. He was so enthusiastic about my getting to know her that it sounded like boasting. He said, Mary come all the way out here from Wisconsin by herself. She's been living alone, just the dog to talk to, working, going to school, working 18 hours a day. No dates, no movies, no music. She can play the flute as well as any member of a symphony orchestra, but she's got it hidden in the closet. She's already got two college degrees. I wasn't sure if he was telling me how smart she was 
or wondering aloud how much education a person needs. Earlier, I'd heard him tell someone that his own schooling had been cut short in the third grade. When she returned, Mary went to the kitchen and filled the dog's bowl with water. Then she joined us in the living room where Charlie was tuning a guitar. He asked her if she intended to play the flute with him, and she just smiled. Not now, she begged off. So he played for us. He sang popular love songs and ballads, a cowboy tune, and a few he said he'd written in prison. He strummed jazz and fingered Spanish classical, but it was his voice, I thought, most worthy of attention. It sounded like one of the crooners I grew up with, hearing on the radio, a Crosby or a Sinatra. Its quality was that good. And he was unselfconscious about it, a natural. At times I saw him as robustly handsome, not just for the shape and features of his face, but for its expressive content. Later that night, I watched cards, coins, and cigarettes disappear and reappear, slipping through his fingers. Not only did the tricks capture my awe, but his showmanship and his spirit. I had to remind myself that this person could barely read, and that I looked down on him. For in a world of novels, he was just one fascinating character. In a dark room, I sat fully dressed, thinking of the old life, and here, the new. I wanted to hold on to both. As I expected, he came in, put his arms around me, and I, in my actions, said yes. No. Yes. No. With the history of old movies in mind, and no intention of giving in at all, he gently pushed me away from him. I pushed him back. He laughed, but said, Who do you think you're fooling? And walked out of the room. I was glad it was dark. In the misty morning, I ignored a wish to sleep, got up, straightened my clothes, and made the bed. Mary came in, stripped the bed, and began gathering things we might need for the trip. After toast and coffee, we loaded the trunk of her elderly sedan with plenty of her clothes. Charlie said we wouldn't need all the food from her cupboards, her stereo and speakers, and a stack of her record albums. The Beatles, Ravi Shankar, Country Joe and the Fish, her dog, Muffet, and her last paycheck. I had no money at all, but since I'd regularly tanked up the family car, I had my dad's standard oil credit card. Charlie began the drive north, asking Mary to take over so that he could look at the scenery. He didn't call it scenery. That's the word I would have used, as in backdrop, for all the important actors. I cannot tell you which route we took, or whether those were Douglas firs or Loblolly pines we were passing. I was just a tired hitchhiker on their vacation. I thought we would arrive at his mother's house, but they began looking for cabins to rent near Mendocino, a speck of coastal town two hours north of San Francisco. Whether they found one in a newspaper or by conversation, Mary paid rent to a bent and barnacled landlady who lived far from the property. The dark wood cabin denned at the end of a retired resort road had only three rooms. A bathroom, 
a large kitchen, and a combination living room slash bedroom with one double bed. The landlady had offered to rent us an extra bed, but Mary and Charlie had declined, and I'd felt embarrassed at what she must think. By the time we got to the cabin, we had all taken showers, and Mary had made the bed. I was exhausted, but uneasy when they began to undress. Charlie didn't wear anything to bed. Mary stripped down to her underwear and a cotton camisole. When they got into bed and turned out the light, I got in beside her. I kept my clothes on. Charlie slept soundly and rose early. Mary and I woke and tried to go back to sleep. We heard him talking to the dog and they went out together. Soon, Mary rolled out of bed, making motorboat sounds with her mouth. Turning her long, thin back to me, she dressed in jeans, a flannel shirt, and thick cotton socks. She handed me a pair with a shy smile and encouraging blue eyes. She was unquestionably Scandinavian, raised in the northern Midwest where they speak in short, chopped sentences, like in the cold. I perceived something else in her large, direct eyes. It was fear. Neither of us was accustomed to sharing a bed with two people we barely knew. While Mary was in the bathroom, I lingered in bed, trying to understand what to do that day. I thought about my boyfriend. He was tall, tan, and mentally keen, an experienced surfer and as good-looking as any male model. He was also moody, could be mean, and even when we were together, neither of us felt complete. I was too inexperienced for him. Maybe when I went back, things would be better between us. Outside our cabin, the sun-dappled foliage reminded me of summer camp. The air, cool, crisp. Muffet appeared between the trees with Charlie behind her, his face radiant. Bending to run his hands through her fur, he said that they had seen this and they had done that and as if he and the dog were in the same mindscape. Mary started breakfast, and they talked about going to the beach. I grabbed the moment to read. I had planned to get a number of books to read that summer, mainly so that I could return to school and say I'd read them. I wanted erudition. But I also wanted credits in my educational account. I was reading Steppenwolf by Herman Hesse when Charlie said something remarkably similar to what I'd just read. This first thrilled, then made me suspicious. He said he didn't read. He read road signs. He could read. But he didn't read books. How could he know anything? 